the Bitcoin Group, the American original. For over the last 10 seconds, the sharpest Satoshis, the best Bitcoins, the hardest cryptocurrency talk. This week, we'd like to welcome Davi Barker from shinybadges.com. Hello. Chris J from Feathercoin. Hello. Megan Lords from Bitcoin Not Bombs. Howdy. And Will Pengman from Bitcoin Milwaukee. Good morning. Will screen share work? Issue 1. Apple bans final Bitcoin wallet from the App Store. The Apple of Steve Jobs and Steve Wozniak is truly dead. No reason was given with many speculating that Apple is using monop monopolistic control of the App Store to clear the way for an Apple-branded payment network. How damaging is the banning of the final Bitcoin wallet from the App Store on a scale of 1 to 10? 1 being not bad at all, 10 being absolute cataclysmic devastation. I ask you, Davi Barker. I mean, isn't, isn't Apple the company of cracking their merchandise? I mean, people don't like Apple products, people crack Apple products, people put whatever software they want on it, so I don't see this as particularly devastating. I mean, it makes Apple look stupid. It's going to make them look even stupider when they have to, you know, change their position. Uh, <laughs> but, um, no, I mean, they're going it, it, it's they're going to lose business, but anybody who wants to figure out how to put Bitcoin on their iPhone, I'm sure they can figure it out. And the blockchain app is available in Cydia, the uh, unlocked or jailbroken iPhone store. Chris J. Yeah, I think that, that Apple are just an average company ever since you know Jobs passed away. Um, they just they just do everything that's far too predictable, far too rational. Um, they're not giving people any surprises, you know, like like we used to get. And so, yeah, I think this is Internet Explorer all over again, and it's going to massively backfire because you're going to have projects like CoinPunk, CoinPunk.org. I had the pleasure of meeting Kyle the other day, who's the uh, the founder of that, and that allows people to actually host their own Bitcoin wallets from their own server and then access their funds through a browser. So I. Bitcoin, uh, sorry, Apple aren't going to be able to ban access to funds through the browser. They're also not going to be able to ban SMS access as well. Megan, Lords. Yeah, I'm going to have to go with probably like a three. Um, this is predictable Apple behavior. I mean, they've, they're they always trying to crush their competition, but they're, they always go about it in really bad ways, and this is just going to cost them business. Uh, I've seen so many people literally destroying their iPhones, too, mm. um, and switching over to uh, droids, and it just makes sense, and they're going to lose a huge uh, emerging market um, you know, of Bitcoiners. Uh, so it's a really bad decision, but I think it might kind of get in the way a little bit of trying to get businesses on board who are already comfortable using Apple products, who don't know, who don't have, you know, the understanding to be able to jailbreak the phones and get those apps in there. So there might be a little bit of a hindrance with that, but I think overall it is a really bad decision, and I think they're going to regret it. Will Pangman. Um, in the near term, I would say uh, four and a half, five, because I think one of the best outreach tools that uh, Bitcoin proponents or Bitcoin evangelists have is, you know, as soon as someone approaches them or you or, or they approach some some person on the street to talk about Bitcoin, um, one of the best mechanisms to to getting folks involved is, you know, skip all the talk and just go right to downloading a, a wallet app and then give that person a dollar or a few dollars. I, I love that approach. Um, I know I've shared it uh, on this show a number of times and we do it every week at our meetup with anyone who doesn't already have any Bitcoin. So that puts a huge dent in the, um, you know, so many people are iPhone users, especially the wave of adopters that is about to come and, and right now that we're seeing. Uh, most of them are, you know, uh, from the more mainstream crowd, if you will, and uh, less the, the tech-savvy crowd, at, um, at least at this point. And, uh, yeah, so the inability to, to help folks who have an iPhone get a Bitcoin wallet, at least in the short term, is, is severely hampered. And it's bad news. It, just like the other panelists said, it's a really unwise play on the part of Apple because there's so many workarounds, and if there aren't, if even if there weren't any workarounds, I'm sure within a week we'd see them. So 
all those things are exciting. I'm really, you know, I, I, I talk all the time. I really like to see the hypocrisy of these um, various, you know, entities uh, shoved in their face or, or, you know, it's like a, a pie joke, you know. It's like a cream pie to the face once, once they, um, you know, they have to eat their words. And I think, like the panelists agree, you know, uh, Apple's going to have to either reverse this decision or, or step it up a notch, and neither of which is good for them. So very, very unwise play. We'd like to welcome Andreas Antonopoulos. We were just discussing Apple, who earlier this week banned the blockchain out wallet from the App Store. What are your thoughts? So a uh, quick uh, disclaimer, I have a conflict of interest. I'm the Chief Security Officer of uh, Blockchain, and so this comes with a matter of bias and personal interest. Um, I was appalled. I just wrote an op-ed on the Boeing Boeing blog, which just got published uh, about this. Uh, I think it was a rather ill-advised move. But, you know, Blockchain was the last Bitcoin wallet remaining in the App Store. And when you are the gatekeeper of innovation in a walled garden with a world that's moving far too fast to keep up, uh, that's a really lonely spot to be in. Listen, there were maybe uh, half a dozen wallets in uh, 2013, and that's just on Bitcoin. Now we have hundreds of cryptocurrencies. Uh, Apple is going to get absolutely overwhelmed with a deluge of applications, and they're either going to have to decide that they're banning cryptocurrency as a tech industry and innovation movement as a whole, uh, or they're going to have to revise their policy and, and give up some of the lucrative 30% margins they make on the in-app purchases and closed wallet system that they use. I think uh, they're going to have to reverse this decision, but quite honestly, it doesn't really matter. HTML5 is coming. It's a powerful web platform for developing applications across uh, all browsers. And with HTML5, we've seen one of the last hurdles, which was capturing a QR code from the camera in order to use it in a wallet, has now been overcome. And the HTML5 wallets are coming. Um, I can tell you that blockchain is working hard to deliver a fully functional, beautiful HTML5 wallet that will work across all mobile browsers uh, within the next few months. So this is something that's going to happen across the space. And then Apple really has even fewer choices. They can either go completely Orwellian and start putting per website blocks on their Safari a la Great Firewall of China, or they're going to have a massive inconsistency between what users can get through the browser versus what they can get through the App Store, which really just makes it look like a, a platform that's lacking in capability. Absolutely, and to pick up on Megan's point, it's not difficult at all to jailbreak or unlock your iPhone. All you do is download a program from the internet, run the program, you know, back up your iPhone first, of course, and the program will allow you to install any program that you want on the hardware that you paid money for. Mm -hmm. They call but, but it jailbreaking, but unlocking is a lot more apt. But to Will's point, I mean, um, this has been the main way to create user adoption. And we don't necessarily want to stay within the confines of the geek community that have this sophistication to Leaving London last week, I took a taxi ride that only lasted about eight minutes from, uh, from the hotel where I was staying to King's Cross and Pancras. And uh, I spoke to the taxi driver about Bitcoin. As we were driving, I helped him install the application. I even clicked through some of the screens on his iPhone. And by the end of the taxi ride, in eight minutes, I had installed an iPhone wallet and, and given him his first three or four millibits. And I do that with every person I meet. This is a very important adoption tool. Uh, it's a very important education and user awareness tool. And to keep it only for the geek technorati is, is a terrible blow to, to, to Bitcoin. We really need mainstream adoption. And Apple, whether we like it or not, is the phone of the common man. It's the easiest one to use. Uh, not everyone uh, wants to use more sophisticated and open platforms like Android. Those that do have already made the switch in droves. Uh, but we want to get everyone. And, and that means we need to be on iOS. I can also announce today that there is a Dogecoin wallet that has been released in the App Store. It's called my Doge. So everyone is counting down to see when they pull the Dogecoin wallet, if they indeed do. Well, exactly. I mean, that's the point. It's like it's not just Bitcoin. There are hundreds of other cryptocurrencies, each with their own dozens of wallets, and that's just counting wallets. There are going to be many other financial innovation applications 
based on cryptocurrencies. So uh, Apple's position is not simply they're banning Bitcoin wallets. Apple's position is they are banning the technology wave of cryptocurrencies. And, and that is a very difficult position to hold in the long run because whatever happens to Bitcoin, cryptocurrencies are here to stay and they're going to be a hugely empowering technology for billions of people around the world. Apple can't stay on the sidelines for long. Exit question. How long before Apple changes its mind, if ever? Davi Barker. I give it four to six months. Chris J. Uh, when it affects that bottom line. Megan Lords. That's pretty much what I was going to say when they start seeing people leave in droves. Will Pangman. I'm going to give him three months. Three months. Andreas Antonopoulos. Uh, I'm not that confident. I mean, I think Apple is a giant behemoth and we're just a gnat. I would say by the end of the year, uh, they're not going to feel the pinch from this at all. Issue two. Bitcoin now accepted at every 7-Eleven in Mexico. 7-Eleven put up a huge Mexico-sized test balloon recently, announcing that customers would now be able to pay in Bitcoin via the Padmobile wallet service. Bitcoin in convenience stores. Bitcoin and gas stations. Is this bigger news for Mexico or bigger news for Bitcoin? When will I be able to buy a Slurpee with Bitcoin in the U.S.? Is brick and mortar about to go brick and Bitcoin? I ask you, Chris J. Yeah, and this is this is great for Mexico. I think um, I think I would really like to see more of these uh, wallet apps that already exist, things like M-Pesa, take up Bitcoin because now the merchant doesn't have to do anything. As far as I'm aware, uh, the 7-Eleven brand hasn't endorsed uh, Bitcoin personally, have they? Um, it's exactly. just a case that it's just a case that you can spend it there, and that's great because the merchants don't want to be speculators in this market, and that's what we found as well when when we go out and we canvass to get merchants into cryptocurrency, they they don't like the volatility. So if somebody can take care of that for them, then I think that's absolutely fantastic. Megan Lords, I wish Derek J was here because he's always talking about how he wants to see gas stations and convenience stores take Bitcoin. This is great news for uh, Mexico and for Bitcoin. Um, and you know, I, I'd like to see other places. I think it's still probably going to be a while though. Um, but yeah, I, I think it's excellent news all around. So hopefully that kind of um, encourages other convenience stores to uh, get involved. Will Pangman. Um, I'm usually very optimistic about these kinds of things, but uh, like um, full scale wide, uh, all the franchises in any large corporation, you know, brick and mortar businesses adopting Bitcoin, I don't see happening anytime soon in the U.S. But certainly, those um, franchisees can can do it on their own, and uh, we've seen that um, in a number of places. So I'm. Um, just gonna put an open call out there to all of the you know passionate Bitcoiners. Um, get involved in your local meetups. Uh, develop strategies to reach out to particular business owners who you might find friendly to you know uh, Bitcoin adoption and support them and be their customer support, their tech support you know for them, facilitating uh, an easy time. You know, small business owners spend uh, a lot of time um, working on their back end, if you will, and um, that's not always where the money is made, you know. So if you can help uh, facilitate that, I think we'll see more retail, um, convenience stores, gas stations adopt Bitcoin because of the obvious advantages. And um, yeah, Bitcoin activists better get to work. Andreas Antonopoulos. I think what's most interesting about this announcement is the fact that what we're seeing is uh, uh, large chain stores that have franchises. The franchisees are a hotbed of innovation in these spaces. So you see individual franchisees deciding to adopt things that will attract more customers into their individual store. But in this particular case, it, it seems like it, it's a it's a chain wide uh, reaction. I, I'm very happy to see uh, this kind of thing, especially in Mexico, because this uh, this kind of option could really bootstrap the remittances flow from the U.S. to Mexico, which I think is one of the most important targets for Bitcoin. Davi Barker. You know, this makes me think of uh, BitcoinStore.com. One of the sort of mission statements of BitcoinStore.com when they launched was that they were going to charge a very sort of low profit margin because their purpose was to put pressure on other online merchants to begin to accept Bitcoin. Otherwise, they would lose 
business to Bitcoin store. So I would really like it. I mean, Mexico is not that far away. In fact, for me, it's closer than a lot of the places that I'm going next month. So, I mean, I would really like to see... If you saw adoption in Mexico, first off, you're going to see a lot of economic prosperity in Mexico, which is going to do interesting things to the uh, immigration debate. But it would also put pressure on anybody who was losing that economic capital to Mexico on, in the sort of border states to like say, well, maybe we need some of this business here. Maybe you know, maybe we need some of that prosperity here in Texas or Arizona or California. Like I would like to see it so successful that it puts pressure on merchants in the United States to say we should follow their lead. Absolutely, and just to build on Andreas's point, uh, we talk often of how it's easy to send Bitcoin overseas, but for me, thinking it out in my mind, once they get the Bitcoin, what are they going to do with it? And this now, at least they can buy Slurpees. So little steps like this, being able to fill in the gaps in this market and to explain to someone, well, you sent a Bitcoin home to your mother, what's your mother going to do now? How is she going to convert that into pesos or food or whatever they happen to need? Well, so, is it like 7-Eleven here? Because it seems like maybe 30% of 7-Elevens here are also gas stations. And if that's the case, then that's much more significant than being able to buy Slurpees and hot dogs. It's, it's tough to say. I believe it's mainly this Padmobile wallet service has accepted Bitcoin because they also said it was uh, you could spend Bitcoin now in uh, Gandhi bookstores. So there are a couple of chains that have this uh, wallet service, which is you know just another way to convert your Bitcoins into the wallet service and then to spend wherever you'd like. I believe Chris mentioned M-Pesa, which is a similar system. So... Exit question. Which corporation should try out Bitcoin next? Best Buy, McDonald's, Taco Bell, Chris, Jay? Yeah, it needs to be a multinational. Um, it needs to be somewhere so that we can actually start getting the wealth out of the Western world and into the developing countries because I think if we make that a priority, then the Western brands will have to catch up. Megan Lords. Yeah, I, I don't know... Um, yeah, I don't know that I, uh, I... I think more people adopting Bitcoin is great, but I'd really like to see it kind of more locally oriented, getting your smaller uh, stores involved, or even some of, you know, the franchises are independently owned. So I, I'd really like to kind of see it take off um, on that level. Uh, yeah, kind of keeping... Yeah. <laughs> Will Pangman. Netflix. Netflix. Andreas Antonopoulos. Uh, local stores, I think, are more important than the big franchises or big chains. Uh, they have the highest pressure on their small margins. So the little store around the corner from you, and you need to help them. Davi Barker. I, um, I'm doubling down on video games. I'd like to see Blizzard or some other massively multiplayer online role-playing game uh, company adopt Bitcoin as an in-game currency so that um, I can use it to buy swords or gold or wizard spells or potions or things like that. I think there's a, a real use for Bitcoin in market simulations as well as in markets. I agree. And uh, just to build on Will and Andreas's point, it is time to help people with Bitcoin. I know I'm tired of removing viruses and spyware from people's computers, but installing a wallet, giving someone a little explanation of Bitcoin, it's not that hard. We should all be doing it. Every computer geek should be helping every non-computer geek get on board with this new currency because it benefits everyone. So, moving on. Issue three. Oh, screen share is going to work again. Mount Gox withdrawal issues. Magic the Gathering online exchange, the venerable Bitcoin exchange, is having withdrawal issues again, this time with Bitcoin, causing the price to drop 20% before recovering. Is this just one poorly written exchange, or does Bitcoin have a real problem? Megan Lords. I think it's unfortunate that one exchange has so much uh, impact on the market. Um, and my instinct is to say this is a Mt. Gox problem, but it is something I have to do more research on. So I'm going to keep it at that. I need to do more research on this. Will Pangman. Uh, yeah, every time we've seen any shenanigans come from Mt. Gox, it's, you know, deeply affected the, the Bitcoin marketplace. Um, it's taken some time to recover even from some of these various, you know, um, 
missteps of theirs, I guess. Uh, it's well documented that they've had a lot of trouble. Um, is it a poorly written uh, exchange? Is, uh, are there liquidity issues? Um, who's to say? I don't know. Those folks on the inside know, and the rest of us just need to take our business elsewhere. I know for, for those who've used Mt. Gox, which is many, many folks, and you probably have um, balances on either side, fiat and crypto, so um, you might be stuck for a while. And we, you know, we we saw we saw this happen in the early summertime in in the U.S. with several uh, U.S. exchanges going down. Uh, Bitfloor was one. Folks had to wait a long time for for those uh, issues to be resolved. Um, but of course, Bitfloor just completely shut down. I think we'd have much bigger problems on our hands than what we've seen yesterday and today if Mt. Gox just completely shut down. So I'm rooting for them only so that they can come in for a landing and um, better businesses that I think are right around the corner. Um, Coinsetter, CoinMarket, um, and all kinds of other exchanges in various countries stepping up. Uh, but hopefully we can bring it in for a landing without any, you know, massive disruptions. Andreas Antonopoulos. Well, I'll never attribute to malice what can be explained by simple gross incompetence, clownish management, and idiots at the helm. Uh, thank you, Gox, for launching this uh, cryptocurrency at a time when there were no other exchanges. It's now time to fade off into the sunset. Um, I don't think there are any liquidity or solvency problems with Mt. Gox. What we're seeing is the fifth Goxing in a series of uh, sequential Goxings, all of which have been the result of gross incompetence and clownish management by Mr. Carpellis. Uh, here's the thing, if you try to write an exchange based on PHP MySQL as a single monolithic stack application, and then you build that on top of a custom version of Bitcoin that doesn't quite follow the consensus protocol, every time you have a problem, that problem gets exasperated by scale, then you add on top of that incompetent communications that create a panic that further exasperates the scale problems, and the whole thing comes crashing down, and we've seen this story play out five times already. Now, the good news is they have the money, so eventually people will see their money, and it's not going to be a huge problem. The even better news is that they only control 20% of the volume, so this is an insignificant glitch. And the best news of all is that Bitcoin went below 700, and I bought me some today at the Friday Bitcoin sale, and it was awesome. Now let's get back to running Bitcoin the way it should be instead of clownish management like Mr. Carpellis. Moving on. Davi Barker. Man, you guys have me following Andreas, so it's virtually impossible <laughs> to say anything intelligent. Uh, so I'm going the opposite. Never attribute to incompetence what you can attribute to malice. I think that this is an inside job. I think Mt. Gox is struggling to remain relevant, and so they are causing a crisis to generate headlines. Because other than this, I haven't heard of Mt. Gox in months. I didn't even realize they were still around. So, uh, yeah, I'm saying that uh, Mt. Gox is intentionally generating a crisis in an effort to remain relevant. Brilliant. Chris Jay. <laughs> I, I've got quite a lot here. Do you really want me to do this? I, my pet hate are these exchanges. I think the exchanges are the worst part about Bitcoin and, in, and any other centralized aspect of Bitcoin. The, the price goes up when we see more adoption and more diversity and more different ways to, to, to ramp into the market. We see the price go down every time some centralized entity like this screws up. I don't know whether or not they are solvent or not. I've spent a lot of the last few days trying to look into this. I put out a personal appeal to Mark on Twitter and on the IRC where they hide, by the way. They hide out on IRC. It, this is 1994 technology, and this is how they handle their customers, right? And then when you go in there, you get told if you kick up any kind of a stink, even if you make some, you know, speculation, that you'll get banned. Sarah's in there. She's telling you she, you're going to get kicked off of here if you kick up a stink. But hang on, you've got people's money. They have every right to get upset. So look, okay, so what she's saying really is, I don't mind if you speculate on the price if we can take a cut, but if you start speculating in a way that we can't make a margin on it, then, then you're out. Um, so I don't like the way they've handled the communication. They've had ample opportunity to fix this. And this comes on a backdrop of just failed promises. Time and time again, they said they were going to do things and then they failed to deliver. And then they act surprised when people start flying into Tokyo. And, and actually, there was a guy on Reddit, I think I gave you the link to the, to the Reddit post, who literally just uh, hung out in the lobby all day. Mark then turns up with a Frappuccino latte. 
you know, just waltzes on into the office as if there's there's no problem at all. And the dude's like questioning him, he's doorstepping him, he's saying, okay, where's the money? Let's see it. But the problem is all these claims they come out with can't be falsified. They're just claims and nobody knows whether they're true. And so naturally in the speculative market, like I say, a speculative market that they're more than happy to profit from, but then when it works against them, they want to, to ban their users from an IRC channel which, by the way, you need a, a registered email for, so it's not, not even trivial to get that far. No, I think it's an absolute disgrace. The, the, the people that sell the shovels and spades are always the people that make the money, and, and that really that really does get me angry. You know, That really winds me up. So I, I, I really wish they would just go away. We need, we need more things like local bitcoins. We need more of those peer-to-peer -peer exchanges. Yeah, or completely distributed exchanges. Great point. Yeah. Exit question. Does Bitcoin have a long-term problem from the Mt. Gox exchange, or is this much ado about nothing? Megan Lords. Well, it's not much ado about nothing to the people who have been caught up in this, um, but this is something that's been happening quite a bit with Mt. Gox, and it's time for them to be replaced. It's time for there to be better uh, solutions coming out. So um, it's really, yeah, it's really unfortunate uh, what's happened, but this is like this is a pattern of behavior with Mt. Gox, and uh, people need to uh, you know realize that and get out of it. Will Pengman. Yeah, I'll echo Megan. I, I feel for the folks who have their funds stuck in that uh, in that system, and uh, I'm very optimistic. Uh, I, I I think uh, yeah, I'm like Andreas and Chris both pointed out. The decentralized exchanges, open transactions, these kinds of innovations, hopefully we'll see by the end of the year, um, hopefully sooner. Um, and and that, will, that will take care of a lot of the FUD uh, with regard to regulation or centralized exchanges, malfeasance, and so on. So I'm very much looking forward to that. And that's going to just, um, just make, make this whole ecosystem for all the cryptos so much healthier. Andreas Antonopoulos. Uh, Gox isn't a problem for Bitcoin, but what it does is it demonstrates that in an environment where decentralized finance is finally getting a foothold, the one part of it that keeps failing is the centralized exchanges. We now have a decentralized currency, but the on-ramps and off-ramps into and out of that currency are the weak spots. They're the weak spots for regulation, they're the weak spots for fraud, they're the weak spots for theft on custodial accounts, and they're the weak spots for gross incompetence and clownish management. And so as a result, uh, we need to apply the same ethos of the blockchain and create decentralized solutions to decentralized financial systems. What Gox proves once and for all is that centralized financial services are vulnerable in many, many ways. It actually proves the point of Bitcoin and makes it even mm. stronger in the long run. But in the short run, it certainly hurts. Davi Barker. The only sense, I think the only sense in which Mt. Gox can harm Bitcoin in any way is through reputation of people that don't understand the distinction. I think I get emails frequently from people who are interested in entering the Bitcoin market and they want my advice and they'll say something like, I tried to get an account on Mt. Gox but I couldn't figure it out, help me. And I had to explain that a Mt. Gox account was not a Bitcoin account and that I did not recommend that they go there. So in this sense, um, Mt. Gox is being regulated by their reputation. If you're still using Mt. Gox, you're not, you're not reading the market signals. But as much as people are going to associate Mt. Gox, associate Mt. Gox with Bitcoin and think that they are the same, Mt. Gox could potentially harm the reputation of Bitcoin. But there's no technological harm. There's, no, there's nothing about Mt. Gox that's going to harm anybody who's not using it. So, Chris, that's, yay. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's absolutely right. Everything that's been said, I think it does actually damage the, the reputation of uh, Bitcoin in the short run because the first thing everybody wants to know is where they can get their Bitcoin. And like uh, Darby said, that they, they confuse this with being a problem with Bitcoin. Issue four. Let's see. Come on, screen share. Issue four. Rush Bitcoins banned in Russia. Stating that Russia's official currency was the ruble, Russia's Prosecutor General Office banned Russian corporations and Russian citizens from using the fledgling cryptocurrency. Will this ban be successful and good for Russia? I ask you, Will Pangman. Um, will the ban be good for Russia? No, I don't think it'll be successful. You know, the nature of this thing is, you know, people can can possess bitcoins if they want and and if there are certain risks that they're taking in certain jurisdictions for doing so they can 
become knowledgeable of those risks relatively easily. They can mitigate those risks by, let's say, just um, speculating on the future value and, and hoarding, aka saving, their bitcoins. I think Russians would be much better off to do so, if you ask me. Um, so yeah, there might be very, very limited options in terms of transacting with merchants in Russia. Um, so I guess no more subway in Russia, uh, paid for in Bitcoin. But um, yeah, it'll still they can still use it and they can still conduct um, international commerce. I'm eager to see. I have some freelancers who've done uh, some odd jobs here and there for me, and who are in Russia. I've paid them with Bitcoin. They've been happy to receive it. And um, one of them I had to set up to do it. I encouraged them to do that, and I wanted to pay them that way. And they were happy when when that went through. Um, so I'll, I'll be interested to see if they'd like to continue doing business with me. But other than, you know, other than the short-term um, hiccups, you know, again, I think this is another behemoth like Apple, sort of. Um, you know, it's a it's a bigger behemoth. It's a government too. So, but we've seen Russia reverse some of its totalitarian um, initiatives and go back and forth. There's been a lot of that too um, in Russia. So. Um, and this might just be while the Olympics are going on, and maybe they weaken up after after that, because they, they'll they're they've got a very tight grip going on right now. But um, yeah, it's it's bad, bad for Russia. Andreas Antonopoulos. Uh, yes, I, I I would caution that uh, the idea that Russia has banned Bitcoin as a headline has been repeated very often. What's missing from that headline is the scope, jurisdiction, and facts. And we've seen these types of headlines before, and they've been proven wrong. Uh, the fact, has it in fact been translated correctly, and has this in fact been a ban on Bitcoins? The scope, who banned Bitcoins, under what circumstances? And finally, the jurisdiction. Is this a local, a state, or a federal agency within, uh, within Russia? We've seen these pronouncements before. For example, when we had the headline, China bans Bitcoin, what they actually meant was that the federal bank or the central bank had disallowed banks from using Bitcoin as an item on their asset balance sheet, which was a much narrower ban than what we thought, and then we saw exchanges adopting it again. So I don't think Russia has banned Bitcoin. I think we've seen already some articles that are contradicting that claim. Even, however, if Russia bans Bitcoin as a whole, this reminds me of a time in the 90s when there was a tremendous storm in the North Atlantic uh, which had shut down all traffic in the channel between uh, Britain and Europe. And some British tabloids came out with a memorable headline, Europe cut off from Britain. Um, you know, if you ban Bitcoin, who loses? If Russia bans Bitcoin, does Bitcoin lose? Uh, no, Bitcoin is an international or transnational currency, the first of its kind. It's fluid. It moves across borders. Bitcoin succeeds. Bitcoin prevails. Bitcoin con continues completely unfazed. Um, who loses? Well, uh, legitimate Russian businesses that can no longer take advantage of Bitcoin, innovation in Bitcoin in Russia, investment in Bitcoin in Russia, and ultimately Russian users of Bitcoin, they all lose. Uh, and they get to feel the full totalitarian wrath uh, of an out-of-control uh, government that came straight out of the KGB. But other than that, Bitcoin doesn't feel a thing. Davi Barker. Enforced how? Um, <laughs> I'll, I'll tell you what. I mean, Russian is the official language of Russia. Do they ban German? <laughs> Enforced how? Um, uh, there, there's, there's no way to enforce this. I suppose if there were large corporations that were publicly taking Bitcoin, they could target them or whatever. But short of policing every single person's every single communication, there is nothing preventing me from sending a millibit to Russia right this second other than not having a Russian friend that lives there. But <laughs> um, I think it's interesting what Andreas is saying um, because a lot of the things that have been reported as bans turned out to be some weird sort of policy decision. But um, even let's take the worst case scenario. Let's say that they start dragging people out of their homes and forcefully searching their computers for Bitcoin. Um, that would generate a tremendous amount of headlines and Bitcoin would suddenly become much more uh, commonplace and familiar to people around the world reading those stories and horrified by those stories. And it would only result in 
all of Russia's neighbors benefiting more than them. So <laughs> it's it's foolish. It's 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 the old world panicking. That's what these sorts of stories are, and um, you know you you let them panic. Chris J. Yeah, it wasn't banned. I, I said this on Twitter earlier. I posted the link in the sidebar for you to tweet it out again. I, the link to the actual original Russian statement. Um, they basically they just advised that it's just it's just saying if you trade in Bitcoin, this is to commercial entities in Russia that you may be viewed with suspicion. But this is not a ban. This is a statement from a central bank. It's the same as it happened in Thailand. These magazines, okay, just want to sell advertising. That's what they're there for. So they will use link bait and they will entice you in. And we're in a situation now where the comments on a blog or in an article are more relevant than the journalistic piece that goes above it. So just scroll, scroll right down to the bottom first. Don't even read the article. Just scroll right down and look at the comments, especially like Discuss. You know that the app, um, it now surfaces the, the liked comments at the top. So just uh, go there and say, show me the most uprated comments. That's the way to read the media these days. This is junk. This is not. This has not been banned. Megan Lords. Yeah, read your headlines, read your bylines, and most importantly, read between the lines and the comments. I really like Chris's, uh, you know, perspective on that uh, because yeah, I do end up learning a lot more reading higher-rated comments, and there's so much sensationalism when, with so many headlines nowadays, and it's really important to. Read a little deeper into it when they say, oh, this country has banned Bitcoin. Um, no, it wasn't a ban, like Chris said. Uh, they're cautioning uh, you against using it and cautioning against businesses. Seem to have lost Megan there. Exit Come question. On. Yeah. Okay. Sorry, crazy. I wanted to point. I wanted to also wanted to point out that the ruble has been rising against the dollar since about two thousand and nine, and I don't think this is a coincidence. Exit question. Why do people in power refuse to learn the lessons of history? Every time you ban something, you only make it more attractive. Will the Russian people heed the ban and avoid Bitcoin? Yes or no? Will Pengman. Well, I find it interesting, you know, thanks for distilling the information better for us, Andreas and Chris. Um, maybe some Russian people are under the same confusion about the, these headlines and stuff. So, um, uh, yeah, many of them won't, uh, won't be swayed by this, but um, my optimism from a few months ago, hoping that Russia would be one of the next big, um, you know, big geographical centers to jump into uh, Bitcoin acceptance, is a little bit uh, disappointed at this point. So um, they, won't, they won't heed this um, dissuasion by the state, but um, it's it's certainly going to put a damper on adoption in Russia for a while. Andreas, uh, no, no, it's not going to make uh, that huge a difference, at least for the early adopters at this point, uh, because the early adopters are already a self-selecting group. Listen, uh, countries that apply heavy-handed approach to law with very little due process and a lot of capriciousness and arbitrary decisions are countries where the rule of law is not respected by the people. Uh, trust me, I grew up in Greece, I know exactly what it's like. The more heavy-handed the lawmakers, the more heavy-handed the enforcement, the less people respect the law. And to us as Americans, where the rule of law is somewhat stronger, it seems that if something is banned, that would be respected. But in fact, it's the exact opposite. When in countries like this, things that are banned uh, continue to, to operate just, just as if the law hadn't been passed because there's very little respect for the law. Uh, there's more respect for, uh, for power, raw power, and the law is just an excuse to exhibit raw power. That's how things work in Russia. Uh, raw power much matters much more than the law. So even if this has been banned, that nah, won't make a difference. Davi Barker. I think you're making too much of an assumption saying that they haven't learned from the lessons of history. If you look at the history of prohibition of any substance, of any activity, of any anything, it has almost never achieved 
the goal of reducing the use or consumption of that product. But what it has achieved is the militarization of society, the centralization of power in the hands of political uh, of political elites, the centralization of money. And it makes campaigning incredibly easy for them because suddenly their campaigns are these very easy slogans about drugs are bad and okay. So they have learned from the lessons of history. Prohibition makes their jobs incredibly easy. It just doesn't do what it claims it's going to do. Now, if, if their goal is to reduce the consumption of something, if Bitcoin really scares them and they actually want to reduce its use, they would have learned that open prohibition is a bad idea, but creating an environment of fear, creating an environment in which the law is vague, the rules are gray, and enforcement is arbitrary and severe, that might actually reduce people's use of a substance. So if they are learning from the lessons of history, they will be vague, they will not openly ban something, they will instead make examples of people, and that is what we're seeing. Chris, Jay. Yep, I agree with all of that. Um, I don't think that the Russians uh, people will will heed it. And also, these laws these laws are a reaction to threats. So they clearly see Bitcoin as a potential threat. That's why they're acting out. And the laws are also a response by government governments that demonstrate what it is they want to do. These laws are a playing out and a dramatization of what they don't like. They don't actually achieve anything. So yeah, Thank I you think Lawrence. it's good. will the Russian people respect the ban? See, no audio? <laughs> All right, we'll come back to you on the next one. Issue five. Local bit breaking news. Local Bitcoin users in Florida charged with money laundering. At least two At least men two in Florida have been charged thanks to a complicated entrapment plot by the Secret Service. If the Secret Service hadn't have offered them $30,000 for Bitcoins, would they really have been able to break the $10,000 barrier? Isn't this just more Soviet behavior from the Secret Service, pushing Bitcoin underground while doing nothing more than creating more work for themselves? Andreas Antonopoulos. Well, uh, I, I think there's a couple of interesting things going on here. Uh, first of all, the amounts in play were about $30,000. And so for someone to take a $30,000 trade on local Bitcoin, I mean, how stupid can you be? I've had people come up to me and say, uh, I want to get 5,000 Bitcoins, no questions asked. And I'm like, yeah, good try, Agent Smith. I'm not that stupid. Um, you know, entrapment is something that's happening all the time. And um, I think the bottom line here and the most interesting thing is that they've been charged under two different statutes. The first one is operating an unlicensed money service business or money exchange under state uh, regulations and probably under federal regulations as well, but primarily under state regulations. And that's a charge that's going to stick. Doing a transaction of $30,000 uh, uh, in that circumstance would certainly be a problem under uh, Florida's money transmission laws. Um, here's the other interesting one, though. They've been charged, and the biggest headline has been money laundering. Now, money laundering is a charge about transmitting and structuring finances incident to the commission of a crime. And here we have no crime. Money laundering doesn't just happen when you exchange money with someone. It has to involve a crime. No crime was actually committed because they were entrapped in the process of exchanging. So I think the money laundering charges are simply the long tail of the charge sheet that the prosecutor is going to have to drop uh, pretty quickly because it won't stand up in court. It, you know, half this half competent defense attorney will be able to get that charge thrown out. So then it goes down to a money service uh, without a license, which uh, I, I don't know if the statute, if it's a Class A felony or, or a misdemeanor or some kind of civil uh, civil issue that's going to be settled uh, with a fine. Uh, but certainly it sent the message, and the message, I think, uh, is, is loud and clear. Uh, don't do huge amounts of transactions on local Bitcoins. I've often uh, used local Bitcoins to do transactions, mostly with new users and mostly under $100, and that's a nice and easy way to get people involved in Bitcoin. And, you know, I have no worries or feel any risk doing transactions at that level. But $30,000 transactions, you know, you're an idiot to start with, and then the prosecutor who charge you with money laundering is, is a careerist schmuck who's trying to self-aggrandize through these charge sheets. Uh, it seems that Bitcoin is now the brand that prosecutors want to use to embellish their resume. So watch out, people, uh, because you're going to be the patsy that goes down for them. 
Davi Barker. This is that climate of fear I was talking about. Um, this is a case which is not really designed to protect society in any way, but designed to get to garner a uh, headline which will fear people who don't understand it, and and that's what's going on. Chris J. Yeah, uh, Andreas pretty much said everything I was going to say. I think the the the, the people that work inside of the government and law enforcement now are seeing Bitcoin as an opportunity to get something on their resume. I don't see any victims in this crime whatsoever. Megan Lords. Can you hear me now? Yep. Okay, I'm on my phone. <laughs> um, yeah, Andreas pretty much covered it. Um, I don't fault people for not knowing the uh, money laundering laws because it's quite, uh, it's quite some regulations to read through. But you have to exercise common sense with these things. Uh, yeah, if someone's trying to buy, you know, above that ten thousand dollar limit, they're they're probably an agent. You have to be really careful with these things. And uh, yeah, exercise some common sense. I but I, I, as far as the money laundering charges, will they stick or not? It, it's interesting. It, it'll be really interesting to see how uh, you know how they would be able to enforce something like that. Um, but yeah, be very, very careful, especially if you're in Florida doing anything, by the way. Um, it's, it's scary down here uh, as far as law enforcement. They will try to entrap you for anything and everything. So be extremely careful if you're in Florida. Will Pangman. Yeah, it's, um, it's interesting how uh, the, the charge that'll stick and I agree with Andreas on this, the charge that'll stick is not the one grabbing the headlines. You know, people don't want to read about money transmission services and, um, and money transmitter businesses and all these things. That's, that's not uh, sexy. Um, we, again, if you watch the hearings in November, if you watch the hearings in New York a couple weeks ago, um, you know that the buzzword, uh, of course they talked about terrorism and other things, drug activity and narco trafficking or whatever, but they all, I mean, every single time they were scared of anything, money laundering was the term they threw out there. Um, John Matanis from the Bitcoin Foundation, um, I really am grateful that he's, um, he's the chair of that foundation and he has uh, come out in front of, you know, money laundering and calling it for what it is, basically thought crime. That's certainly, that's certainly where I stand as well. So it's interesting that that's, that's the meme they're going for. So um, if there's any sort of, you know, be careful out there, people, like the rest of the panelists said. Um, and, and again, I just want to point out, you know, localbitcoins.com is one of the best exchange services out there because it's not centralized. Um, and and it's, it's not all the way there. It's not all the way decentralized like, like we're going to see hopefully within a year um, with some of these next generation technologies in, in the crypto space. But... Um, it's certainly a, just a, a great option. I mean, I like it to meet people, and I don't think, you know, the headline even on Bitcoin magazine uh, publications, you know, Coindesk and so on, uh, is insinuating that this could be the end of localbitcoins.com. Or I think we're all bracing for, for stuff like that if you're the average user. But, um, but no, this isn't the end of these kinds of services. These two, these two guys, I mean, they, they're in Florida. That's a place where there's lots of international trafficking of all sorts of things, legal and illegal, going on. And that's, I think, why what Megan was getting at, it's so heavily surveilled and, and um, entrapment, um, you know, bait for, for entrapment efforts and stuff like that. So uh, if you're going to do trades like uh, in the five- and six-figure mark, you better trust somebody. You better have lawyers present. You better, if you want to keep it private, you can do that with lawyers present and 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 trust the other party and and um, you know probably not meeting them online and then going to meet them in person for the first time. That's probably not the best way to do something like that. So uh, maybe this is just sifting out some of the garbage. Maybe it's um, overzealous policing. Um, the Secret Service was involved. So. Exit question. How long before a private, secret website like Local Bitcoins is created? How many of them will be created? Can the Secret Service and FBI ever hope to stop them all? Can they really stop a forest fire by burning down the entire forest? Andreas Antonopoulos. Well, I believe there's already a site like Local Bitcoins. It's called Craigslist. 
And if that doesn't work, it's called Facebook. And if that doesn't work, it's called every other website where you can put a comment on and advertise the fact that you're going to be at Starbucks at noon and selling Bitcoin. I mean, this is ridiculous. You can't stop private transactions between individuals. And most importantly, local Bitcoins doesn't handle your money, doesn't have custodial access to your money, and is not involved in the transaction any way other than offering classified services for this. So they're not going to stop or shut down local Bitcoins, and they won't be able to enforce any legal action against it. It's pure free speech, and, and it should continue. Uh, I think it would be advisable to put limits on the maximum amount. But yes, if they, if they really do push it in some countries, you are going to see underground sites in the dark web uh, delivering these services instead. Davi Barker. These sorts of websites already exist. There are exactly 637 squared of them, and uh, there's no policing them. I mean, like, you shut down one website, ten show up. I mean, that's how it works. So, Chris, Jay. Yeah, I, th I think, um, well, f first of all, we've, we've already created a Feathercoin. We've already created a, an exchange on Reddit, and that took the guys about a week in .NET to do. Now, there is, there is contrary to what Andreas said, there is a benefit to them because they do allow for escrow and reputation systems built in. So there, it is obviously better than, than say, using Facebook, but I, the point is well taken. The fact is that states are there to regulate the way in which we contract and relate with one another. That's what they do. And when they intervene like this and they try to stick themselves between uh, comportments and our everyday relationships, they are getting in your way. They are literally stopping you from becoming who you, who you can be. So yeah, th this isn't, if, if it took us a week to do it um, in .NET, it's not going to take anybody any, any amount of time to do. Megan, Lords. Right. Uh, you know, prohibition doesn't work. And uh, like Davi said, these sites already exist. Um, so yeah, th there's no stopping uh, Bitcoin. I mean, I, you know, it, it's bad for lo it made, I guess, maybe make local Bitcoins look bad. But I, you know, I think they're going to recover, and I think there's going to be even more services available. All right, moving on. Would you like to donate to the Bitcoin Group? The Bitcoin Group is now accepting altcoins with our Cripsy trade key or Bitcoins. Donate at the Bitcoin Group. Dot com. Now moving on to questions and answers. Your questions are answers. Of course, the first question is about MaxCoin. Is everybody ready to talk about <laughs> MaxCoin? Um, yeah. I generally, I mean, I've seen the launch. It sounds like they're having troubles. Uh, initially, it sounded like there was a lot of pump going on, a lot of excitement, if you want to call it that, a lot of Twitter posts. So yeah. I can sp I can speak to this because so can I... we reset this story for the listeners who are not familiar with Maxcoin? Yes, yes, please do. <laughs> Let's see, Chris, do you want to intro it and uh, knock it down? Well, I I mean I was getting tip offs about this like a few weeks ago. People coming up to me at the meetup going, "Do you want to get in on this?" Like I was like, "Get in, get on, on what exactly?" Um, I'm really I'm a little bit disappointed in Max, and I'm sorry if he's watching because I'm a big fan of his. But I met. Max at a meetup group just before Christmas at Bank to the Future, which is a Bitcoin startup uh, in London, and he said on camera that he wasn't going to promote any more alt currencies, and he said that they were a distraction, and that the only one that really mattered was Bitcoin, and and this was right after Quark because somebody sort of pushed him on it and said, look, you know, is there a conflict of interest here because you've got a lot of followers, and clearly the people that control the information control the beliefs. If you control the beliefs, you control the price. So there's going to be a, a an element of doubt as to how much he holds. Now I'm sure that he's you know a perfectly ethical guy. I don't think he's going to be doing anything wrong. But uh, yeah, I'm a little bit disappointed that, that he's kind of done this. I, but he's not behind the coin itself. That that's something that's important that should be said. He's not, you know, associated. I think someone's just done this as a kind of vanity project, as a kind of way of, you know, tributing to him. Um, but yeah, if anyone has any anything else to say. Well, I I have a I have a complaint because uh, I was on Max Kaiser's show uh, six mm. days ago, and I got no Max coin. I mean, what the <laughs> hell, Max? I was right there. 
<laughs> not even a tote bag. Not yet, nothing. Not yeah, exactly. Uh, so it, it, here's here's an interesting thought. Uh, I hope it's interesting at least. I've I've been revising my opinion as to the cryptocurrency space, and I've gone from thinking that there will be hundreds to thousands of altcoins to being absolutely convinced that there will be tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, millions of altcoins. Uh, at this point, a five-year-old can go to the to a website, enter the parameters for their proof of work algorithm and the name, and uh, create a coin in about ten minutes flat. That means that people will be creating coins in primary school. Uh, people will be creating brand coins and meme coins and fad coins and personal coins um, and promotion coins and reputation coins and celebrity coins. And you know maybe that's absolutely okay. Uh, you know not everything will have monetary value, but it will still have value, collectible value, or or simply reputation value. So um, I think it's interesting. I think it's uh, it's time we see how these coins play out. And uh, if Max Coin is one of the first ones, then that's great. Uh, by the way, uh, Andreas Coin is coming soon. And I'd like to encourage you all <laughs> to join me in pre-mining the crap out of all of it. Uh, we're going to pre-mine 99.9% of it. And, and then we're going to flog it. That's Ripple, isn't it? Thing crowd. Uh, no, it's Andreas Coin. You see, that's, you've, got to, you've got to get the branding right. It's all about the branding. But, but seriously, no, I think this is an interesting development, and really it shows that uh, the value of a coin no longer comes from the fact that only a few entities in the world can create currencies. It now has to come from other sources. We have to evaluate each coin on its merits and on whether its adoption leads it to have monetary value. And you never know. Maybe one of these coins one day be uh, becomes a coin that actually has monetary value. And what's more interesting is that sometimes these brands show up when you least expect them. Uh, so you know, you, you go to uh, you go to places in Africa and you see people worshiping brands that they 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 see secondhand from from the Western world. Uh, maybe Max Coin becomes the national coin of the Republic of Congo by coincidence, and people have no clue who Max is, but mm -hmm. nevertheless they use this coin because it's tradable within their community. Weird things happen when you have a free and open market that has the full range of possible currencies in it, from the really important ones with strong monetary value and backing like Bitcoin, all the way down to pump and dump scam coins, and it's, it's healthy to have a broad range. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I, like I agree with that. I want to point out um, something I, I read recently. I think it was maybe a Twitter post. But, um, you know, governments determine the value of fiat money, and that's what we're used to. That's what we've been used to for thousands of years, perhaps. Um, the people, you know, it's often said that the people determine the value of any money, but it, that's, that's not the case. Let's clarify that governments determine the value of fiat, and the people determine the value of cryptocurrencies. That's that's the the, mo the money that people can determine the value of. So, um, just to Andreas's point, you know, the coins that see network effect, the coins that see mass adoption, they'll have a value, and others will be more collectible or playful. Um, I really like imagining what uh, grade school would have looked like with kids, my peers, developing different coins for all the inside jokes we had or whatever. I mean, how that would have been a lot more fun. <laughs> Yeah, kids like are so creative. Buy, it's definitely happening. Yeah, we should I'd like definitely to buy 5,000 fart coins from you, Will. <laughs> Done. See, exactly. I mean, it's inevitable, isn't it? it LocalFartCoins.com. My username is Will Walkie. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. Um, just a recap for those of you who might have heard, not heard. Max Kaiser is a television presenter in the UK. He works for RT Russia Today and does a financial services program and recently launched his own coin, Max Coin. So if you want to know more, Google that. With all the created or otherwise negative news in the last few weeks and increased interest from VC investors, is there a possibility we're in the process of seeing the Wall Street boys coming in to clean up the organic open source community? I'm not sure. Uh, I'm, what I'm seeing is, uh, I, you know, in Milwaukee, it's not the biggest um, player in terms of metropolitan areas in, in, in the United States. But there are some VC firms here. There are some accelerators. And 
their interest uh, over the summer was practically nil. I mean, I could talk to um, alumni from my high school who work for some of these, and they had interest because I was interested and passionate about it. But, you know, discussions kind of petered out. Um, but now they're coming back not only to me, but other um, passionate Bitcoiners in this area and in Chicago that I'm hearing, uh, and in Madison, Wisconsin, which is a, you know, even a smaller town than Milwaukee, of course. So there's definitely interest in, um, in institutional money right now for any kind of idea. You know, they're asking for software concepts and things like that. Um, I'd like to see some other types of businesses than um, exchange types of businesses, financial services businesses and software. Uh, I think they're, you know, that thinking outside of the box is, is other ideas, um, you know, community-based ideas, if you will. But um, that's what I'm seeing. It's exciting, you know, that, that some of these smaller firms in smaller cities would be open to this now is a big sign for me. Excellent. Uh, a person here has a great amount of bitcoins and they'd like to sell them for USD and they're wondering what the options are to use them and to stay anonymous. I'd say the, right, that, the options we discussed earlier, Craigslist, Facebook, through your friends, things like that, probably be your best way to go. Uh, I don't know spend if them. Snapcard sna Join snapcard.com and spend them. There we go. So there's many options, but it is going to be more and more difficult to uh, sell them anonymously, presumably for the purposes of tax evasion or money laundering. So they're going to be cracking down on that, it seems. Let's see. Next question. I saw one. Um, Where did it go? Well, they're going to be cracking down on that in cryptocurrencies, but they're not going to be cracking down on that if uh, very large, too big to fail banks do it. Let's be clear about that. There's been absolutely not cracked down on money laundering. The biggest money launderers in the world still work in the executive offices of HSBC. None of them went to jail. The second biggest money launderers in the world worked in the executive offices of Wachovia that was acquired by another bank. None of them went to jail. Let's make it clear. And the prosecutors in both of those cases said explicitly that the reason they wouldn't pursue prosecution and would defer prosecution was because of the damage it would do to the financial system by causing these companies to fail. They basically spelled out that too big to fail also means too big to jail. And that was the starting whistle for a race to the bottom in terms of corruption, greed, and fraud. They gave a blank slate to these uh, companies to do as much crime as they want because they will not be prosecuted. Mm -hmm. Only the little fish yep. get stomped on. What, what Andreas just said, I think, you know, we need to, anyone who's got a voice in the Bitcoin space, anywhere at all, um, needs to echo exactly what Andreas just pointed out whenever they're met with uh, that criticism with regard to money laundering or illicit activity. That should be the first default response, and then you can go into other discussions. That needs to be pointed out and repeated over and over. You know what? They beat us over the head in the media with endless repetition, neurolinguistic programming. We must kind of do it back to them, you know? And that, this is a fact that's, you know, that just is undeniable, needs to be uh, repeated endlessly. Well, I think it's also important not to claim that money laundering is not a crime uh, because, you know, we do live within a certain set of laws. So, yes, money laundering is a crime. Unfortunately, fortunately, whatever your political position may be, that's not the point here. The point is that uh, some crimes have consequences, some crimes have prosecution, and there's a rule of law that is being bent out of recognition. I think the most important fact of these numbers is that in the process of money laundering, $670 billion through Mexico, HSBC powered the Sinaloa cartel that resulted in the deaths of 19,000 people. 19,000 people were murdered, and the blood is on the hands of HSBC executives who didn't go to jail and Wachovia executives who both funded the Sinaloa cartel. So let's not claim that this is just a victimless crime because sometimes when you money launder to the cartels, they kill people. When you money launder to individual users who go out and buy a joint on Silk Road, uh, maybe it's a victimless crime. But it's not a victimless crime when HSBC does it on an industrial scale in the middle of a war zone uh, as is in Mexico. Next question is a little technical. How do contributors to Bitcoin's core protocol on GitHub achieve consensus in the case of a patch versus patch conflict? Andres, you want to take that one? 
Um, they uh, they do the individual contributors do a pull request, and then the rest of the developers um, weigh in with uh, either an endorsement, like a plus one, if they agree with it, uh, or with corrections. Usually with uh, questions, corrections, and discussion, uh, which gradually causes the patch to be modified. But this is for patches that don't cause a hard fork in the blockchain. Uh, any kind of thing that would cause a, a hard fork in the blockchain takes months and months and months of preparation and happens extremely rarely. And there the issue is not achieving the consensus of developers, but achieving the consensus of the other uh, four major constituencies in the Bitcoin consensus system, the miners, the merchants, the end user wallets, and the, and the large web wallet companies. Uh, and such changes are very difficult to do. In fact, my prediction is that over time, we're going to see those slow down to a trickle. And so probably within a year and a half or two from now, it will be absolutely impossible to do a hard fork change to Bitcoin because the economy uh, and the stakes will be too high behind it. And at that point, uh, whatever we've baked in is done, and the rest of the stuff will happen to happen at higher layers uh, or if it's critical in an altcoin. Very good. Another technical question. Is there script mining software that works better than CG Miner? Uh, it seems to be working poorly for him. The kernel needs optimization. Is anyone working on a software miner for script? It's a little technical for me. Uh, anyone? Well, I think the only other miner I know of that, uh, that operates with script, I think, is BFG miner, but I'm not sure. Um, so I'm not sure. Yeah. Those uh, are the two top miners. There's, a, there's another question about ghash.io and the 51% attack, but I think we covered that really well last week or a couple weeks ago if you want to check through it again. Basically, 51% attacks are not a problem. 51% attacks are not a problem. For God's <laughs> sakes. Who's going to invest sounds, hundreds it of It sounds so exciting. It sounds like you would overweigh them and you'd be 51% and you'd take over the whole network. Doesn't it yeah, sound exciting? Yeah, for 10 minutes, at which point you'd be kicked off the network and nothing will happen. It's not, mm. listen, 51% attacks are problems for uh, coins that are bootstrapping. And they were problems for Bitcoin in the first two years. And they're problems for all of the altcoins until they bootstrap enough hashing power. At this point, the incentives are aligned in such a way that no one can do a 51% attack and gain anything other than strengthening the network against 51% attacks, outing themselves and falling flat on their face at a cost of hundreds of millions of dollars. Uh, there is no issue with 51% attacks. Can we please drop that topic? Um, before we drop the topic, I want to just make make sure one thing's clear. Sorry, Andreas, but this is a... This is a this is the point that doesn't get explained very well, I think, to the people who are asking the 51% attack question. And that is, um, you know, even in front of these, um, these hearings and stuff, um, at being asked this question, the, the lovely panelists who are advocating for cryptocurrency even miss the mark, I think, on this. And maybe you can clear this up one more time for all of us so we can explain it better to people. Um, for 10 minutes, they can perform this attack. And in Bitcoin, it would require hundreds of millions of dollars to do that for just the first 10 minutes. After that point, they'd either be booted off or they'd have to um, invest much, much more money to continue the attack beyond the, the one block. Uh, is that, can you help me? No, no. The, so, so the case is that in order to mount a 51% attack, you have to uh, probably covertly assimilate uh, enough computing power and then launch it on the network, which is going to be noticed. Or you're going to have to co-op large mining pools and persuade them that what you're doing is relevant so they don't abandon you as happened with ghash.io. Uh, but, but the bottom line is that the only thing you can achieve with a 51% attack is a double spend. So you could do a massive double spend, and, and you would only be able to do that for as long as nobody notices. But as, as soon as you do a double spend and cause a, a fork in the blockchain, uh, that gets noticed. I mean, those things happen about uh, once every two days or once a day on average. You have an accidental fork. Uh, not accidental, but a coincidental fork when two people discover a block at the same time. But uh, but major forks don't happen very often, and forks that have double spend certainly don't happen very often. Uh, these things get noticed, and there's monitoring systems in place. So if you did pull this off, you would expend an enormous amount of money to do a double spend. Now here's the thing: as soon as you do that, 
the reputation damage you would cause to Bitcoin, cause the price to drop. So the double spend transaction you would have done would be in a currency that has far less value than when you started. But you spent all of the computing money in uh, in fiat or dollars or something like that. So this is not a profitable exercise, and all you can do is a double spend. The most important thing to realize is that you cannot use a 51% attack to change the core protocol or to invalidate any previous transactions or to steal money from somebody if you don't have the keys. Uh, because there are broader constituencies in Bitcoin, so all you could do really is affects the next few blocks. Uh, and that's mm -hmm. an attack that is unprofitable um, and would be very, very quickly noticed. Mm -hmm. the, the only other point that um, I would love for you to cover for everybody, for, for us on the panel here so that we can better explain it to the people we talk with and for anyone listening, is what if the incentive isn't to make money but to destroy Bitcoin? Well, if the incentive is to destroy Bitcoin, then you can do a 51% attack by spending hundreds of millions of dollars, in which case you wouldn't get protocol consensus to change anything, but all you would achieve is a double spend, which would seriously damage the reputation of the network by showing that 51% attacks can happen, at which point you get booted off the network, you would have wasted your money, uh, we'd recover um, we'd recover all of that uh, by rebooting the blockchain from a previous point, undo all of the work you did with the double spend, and then Bitcoin would get stronger again. So it would actually end up proving the double spend attacks are not effective unless you're, not, uh, unless you're bootstrapping uh, a small coin. So even with malicious intent, with no intent for profitability, it would be enormously counterproductive there are far easier and more effective ways to attack Bitcoin uh, than, than a 51% than a attack. It's better to play by the rules and use your mining equipment for mining than to try to steal. And that's, that's correct. I mean, the incentive Satoshi. structure of Satoshi's vision worked beautifully, and the bigger the network gets, the more effective those incentives are. We have a follow-up for Andreas. How do we implement the Bitcoin neutrality fungibility if there is give and take year timeline before we can implement the fundamental that would cause a hard fork in the blockchain? I'm not sure. Well, I, I, I think, well, I mean, this is, this is a key point, which is that we probably only have about a year and a half to two years before uh, Bitcoin is, is so large that we cannot do hard forks. Uh, without lining so much consensus that they become almost impossible. Essentially, the model I'm looking at is, at some point, uh, the IP, the Internet Protocol IPv4, achieved such network effect that we couldn't upgrade it anymore. And IPv6 is now being a 16-year effort uh, to upgrade the core Internet Protocol uh, that has been thwarted so many times because it's embedded in hardware, it's embedded in developer consciousness, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. If the same thing happens with Bitcoin, at some point, it's going to have so much momentum and inertia that it will be impossible to do uh, to get enough consensus to do a hard fork change in the protocol. We need to bake in several of the core features of the protocol before then, uh, if we want to make changes to the core protocol, or if the developers want to make changes, or all the stakeholders want to make changes. So I think anonymity and fungibility is a key one. Now the good news is a lot of people are working on this problem. A lot of very very smart people. So there are many core developers. Uh, such as, uh, for example, uh, Peter Todd and Adam Back and Greg Maxwell, who are just cryptography geniuses. I mean, hats off to all three of them, uh, as well as many of the other core developers who have strong principles and, and great coding skills. But, you know, those three really have some incredible cryptography skills. And they're working on, on several improvements to enable uh, greater fungibility and anonymity, and I would, I would love to see those make it into the core protocol. But even if they don't, uh, I think anonymity is something we can also implement at the edges uh, using protocols like CoinJoin and a newer development uh, that Peter Todd developed, which is CoinSwap. Uh, there's a lot of things that you can do at the edge of an open network where innovation is permitted uh, by applications connected to the edge uh, to achieve uh, anonymity even if the core protocol doesn't allow it. Even after, for example, IPv4 became stable and could not be upgraded anymore, uh, changes at the edge, such as network address translation and quality of service within the TCP protocol, allowed us to implement voice and video at large scale, uh, things that originally were considered impossible once IPv4 uh, got ossified. So I, I think we've got 
plenty of opportunities, uh, and uh, um, you know these things will get done because there's demand for them. All right, the final question today: Does anyone have any thoughts on Iceland's 50% pre-mined Aurora coin? Nope. I uh, I did read recently that there's Maza coin, the official currency of the Lakota Nation, which is very exciting for um, uh, sovereign Native American nations like that. Um, and if Iceland wants to do something similar, I mean, hey, they've, they've led the way on a number of things. Hey, they jailed bankers. Oh, my goodness, right? Yeah, go think... Iceland. Yeah, I think sovereign coins are going to be a big theme in 2014. We're beginning to see uh, smaller countries peel off from the herd. And once that starts happening and people start looking around, then you're going to see a stampede reaction. We're also going to see small banks within these nations peeling off from the herd and adopting, co-opting, or embracing uh, cryptocurrency, either Bitcoin or other cryptocurrencies. And again, what that does is it causes a stampede uh, because nobody wants to be outcompeted. Uh, if you see the bandwagon starts rolling, you want to be on top of it instead of underneath its wheels. I think it's unfortunate the, the Iceland coin isn't officially backed by the government. I know that the uh, designers have the idea to give every citizen in Iceland about 33 Aurora coins, but I'm not sure how they're going to carry that out without government assistance and support. So, Megan, do you have something to say? I was just going to say go Aurora coin. <laughs> I hope it works out. I think that's awesome, and Iceland has already shown uh, that, you know, they, you know, they know what's going on, and they, like Will said, they jailed the bankers, and, and I, you know, I think uh, the people are going to be really resistant to a lot of things that other countries may not be. So, uh, yeah, I really hope Aurora Coin uh, succeeds for Iceland. And now it's time for everyone's favorite part of the show: predictions. Davi Barker, are you ready? I'm all set. All right, go ahead. I think next week we're going to be talking about Namecoin. Chris J. It's muted, not ready. <laughs> what about uh, Namecoin? Really? And now, now that we have Ethereum, mm. didn't they? Didn't they? Didn't they like reduce uh, Namecoin? Look at that! To, like, didn't even months. take a week. It took thirty <laughs> seconds. We're talking about Namecoin. Bobby <laughs> <laughs> <Probably> wins. <laughs> <laughs> I, I will say that Namecoin is definitely the slowest wallet I've been trying to synchronize for the last three or four days. I don't really? Know it was way faster than about. Bitcoin when I first installed my Bitcoin wallet. <laughs> not lately. It's taken you three to four days to sync up your Namecoin wallet? I'm not sure it's really working, but yeah. I, Are I you doing it over dial-up? <laughs> no, I have five. <laughs> Megan, your prediction. New Hampshire will secede and Florida will fall into the ocean. Wow, that's detailed. <laughs> Will Hangman. Uh, I had one a second ago, and then Davi made me laugh. Dang it, Davi. <laughs> We're still Give waiting Chris. for a I'll prediction take... from Chris J. We could come back to you. Chris, do you have a prediction for the fans at home? We yeah, I think, that, I, think, I think this uh, Gox Saga is going to continue, so I still think we'll be talking about the Gox Saga. Gox Saga. Will Pangman, anything? That was perfect. I remembered. Yeah, uh, Potawatomi, the next uh, Native American in nation to have a coin. Pato coin. Unfortunately, it seems Andreas has escaped our prediction round, so we'll just move on. Apple's I have a prediction for Andreas. All right, Davi, go ahead. Andreas is going to predict that Apple is going to try to save face on this whole Bitcoin thing by coming out with their own cryptocurrency called the Ringo. Whoa. <laughs> Ringos are very popular. <laughs> My prediction is Apple's attempt to control Bitcoin will fail. Blockchain will soon release their HTML5 Bitcoin wallet and the ban will be rendered toothless. The emperor has no clothes. Apple users will continue using their iPhones for now and will ignore Apple's new payment service. Apple products will no, will no longer be seen as cool. And as each contract expires, more and more people will go Android. Never has there been a bigger miscalculation than Apple's decision to ban Bitcoin. You can't fight technology. Steve Jobs knew that. The current Apple board doesn't. And it's their loss. Bitcoin prevails. Until next time, bye-bye.